Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to be on this panel. I think the framework of the world without the West is really one of the more important big think ideas to come out of the academic study of international relations in recent years. I think it does capture some really important ongoing trends in international politics. What I want to do is to pick up, in a sense, on his second pillar of the world without West, uh, the world without the West, the idea that wealth can be, sustained wealth can be generated um, out of the exploitation development of uh, natural resources and spend a little bit of time exploring that as a driver for new patterns of international politics. Um, I think in many ways, if you wanted to identify what is the most important driver for the emergence of the world without the West, it is structural shift in global energy markets. Clearly, we are in a new world as far as energy is concerned. Um, that new world is manifested most dramatically by the higher energy prices, particularly for crude oil, that we've seen since the turn of the millennium. Um, there are many respectable voices out there who will argue that this <coughs> new world of energy is, in the end, cyclical. Um, Dan Jurgen, for whom I have great regard, has argued this for basically the last five years. He says, historically, the oil business has always been a boom and bust business. We, this is like the fifth cycle of the modern oil industry that we're going through now. And even just a couple of years ago, he and his colleagues at um, Cambridge Energy Research Associates were predicting that today we would have oil prices in the 40 to $50 range because the market was going to respond, new investment in productive capacity, new production coming online, prices would come back down, we'd be in the 40 to $50 range. Um, now, in his more recent public statements, Jurgen is suggesting, well, he can imagine a scenario over the next few years in which oil does go down to 40 to $50 a barrel again, but he can also imagine scenarios in which it goes up to $150 a barrel. And this just confirms for me something that I've been saying since at least 2006, which is that the, the changes in energy markets that we are seeing that are driving higher prices are fundamentally structural. There may be some cyclical aspects to them, surely there are, but the most important part of what's going on is structural in character. And I boil down those structural shifts to two things. One is you had a real demand explosion in the developing world. In the OECD world, the United States essentially accounts for rising demand for energy. But if you look outside the OECD world, you have had this demand explosion. And this goes well beyond the emergence of new demand centers in China and India, as important as that is. One factoid to underline this. We get very concerned about India as a rising demand center. Okay. Oil demand in India is increasing at a rate of something about 50,000 barrels per day per year. In the Middle East, oil demand is increasing at a rate of roughly 300,000 barrels per day per year. And you see this across the developing world, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. You know, these countries have gotten themselves on developmental trajectories that are not going to be easily altered, and they're at places on, their traje on those trajectories where their energy demand is exploding. That is a structural change. We will not be able to reverse that. <coughs> and 
frankly, I don't think we really have any moral standing to try to reverse that. <coughs> the second big structural shift is that productive capacity on the supply side of energy markets has been stretched all along the value chain. This is certainly true for oil and gas, but it's also true for coal, for nuclear power, or just about any other kind of energy you would care to identify. And for oil and gas in particular, the expansion of productive capacity is constrained by the increasing concentration of oil and gas reserves under the control of national governments and their national energy companies. International energy companies, the Exxon Mobil, Total, Royal Dutch Shell, Conoco Phillips of the world, today control or own 7% of the world's crude oil reserve. That's it. 7%. Basically, 80% is owned by national government and their national energy company, which means that it is not going to be <coughs> private companies and investors who decide at what pace resources get developed. Those decisions are taken today by national government and their agent national energy company. And that is a structural change. In the 1970s, 1980s, the OECD world responded to an energy crisis by pushing for greater upstream liberalization in as many places around the world as they could. And out of that, you got big upstream plays in the North Sea, the North Slope of Alaska, uh, over time, the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Guinea, etc. Well, there are no big upstream plays readily available to the international energy industry today. There is plenty of oil and gas to be developed, but the pace at which those reserves will be developed is now being taken not really by market actors, but by political actors, and that is an important shift. The result of this has been, obviously, higher energy prices, as we are all well aware. But I think there is a real strategic consequence to this. And I'll ask you to take a look at this part that we handed out, because I think there is a lot of important information brought together on this part. My argument, basically, is that high energy prices are bringing about a real transfer of wealth, arguably the biggest transfer of wealth from one group of countries to another in the history of humankind. And with that transfer of wealth, there is, at least respectively, a transfer of economic power. Um, the first thing I'll call your attention to on this line is um, the energy price line, the broken purple line. We only carried this line through the end of 2007 because we wanted to be able to show uh, sort of year-to-year -year changes in the energy price and how that correlated with changes in the current account surpluses or deficits of, of various countries. But obviously, you know, cutting it off at the end of 2007 when oil prices were in the $70 range, I mean, there's still, there's been a, obviously a, a further significant increase in prices since, since then. And the broken purple line, though, depicts a pretty steady upward progression in, in crude oil prices. And then what you have on that graph as well are bars that show uh, changes in the current account balances of some important countries in this picture. And what it says, basically, is that there are winners and losers in this transfer of wealth and power. The winners basically fall into two categories. One category, obviously, are major energy exporters. Our sort of proxy for them is the bar for the Gulf Cooperation uh, Council, GCC states, and Russia. 
and you see as the energy price goes up, you see this very hefty uh, increase in the current account surpluses of major energy exporters. That shouldn't come as any surprise. The other category of winners in this process are major manufacturing countries that serve major energy exporters. And the three biggies in this category are China, Japan, and Germany, the countries with the three largest account surpluses in the world, who have managed to grow their current account surplus in a high energy price environment when they are importing, um, in China's case, at least half of its oil. In the case of Germany and Japan, they're importing basically all of their oil. And they're paying out more and more for it, just like every other importer. But despite this, they have been able to grow their current account surplus because of their export growth. And increasingly, their export growth <coughs> is not focused on the U.S. It is focused on new markets, markets in the world without the West, and energy exporting countries are playing a very important role in that export growth. I just saw this morning before I came here, uh, uh, I mean, I think it's a piece of proprietary analysis, so I have to be a little vague about its provenance, but basically a piece of analysis sent to me by a big global network bank looking at how there is now evidence that the trade surpluses of the GCP states are starting to come down, not because these countries are earning less from exports, quite the contrary, but because they're now willing to spend more on imports for big infrastructure projects, things like that. But the beneficiaries of this increased spending by oil exporting countries, it's not the United States, it's not Europe as a whole. It's countries that already have big trade surpluses of their own. China, mm -hmm. Japan, Germany. The United States is not benefiting from this. The UK is not benefiting from this. The EU as a whole is not benefiting from this. These oil exporting countries are now importing more from countries that already have big export surpluses. And I want to come back to that because I think that the idea that the winners in this process of redistribution, that the winners are deepening their economic interconnectivity is if, if Steve has talked about the ideological foundation for the world without the West, the economic foundation is increased interconnectivity between the winners in this process. The big loser in this process is, of course, the United States, which, if you look at the yellow bar, you see it has seen its international financial position deteriorate substantially since the turn of the millennium. Okay. I think there are at least three significant implications that you need to draw from this map. One is that this transfer of wealth and power associated with high energy prices has caused this expansion of global economic imbalances, imbalances that have to be financed. And in practical terms, that means that the U.S. current account deficit has to get financed by these rising surplus countries. In a global context, Germany's current account surplus effectively cancels out the deficits for the rest of the EU, leaves the EU in a very small surplus condition. So Germany's not really playing in this in a global macro sense. What it really means is that the U.S. current account deficit has to be financed by China and by major energy exports. Okay? The second trend that's important to point out is that as this, these conditions have taken shape, government agencies, either central banks or sovereign wealth funds, have replaced private purchasers of U.S. assets as the most important sources of financing for America's current account deficit. <coughs> and then third, energy producers have in the aggregate, and this is, I'll even make it more specific, Middle Eastern energy producers in the aggregate 
have become as important to the financing of the U.S. current account deficit as China is. And if you look at it on a per capita basis, or in relation to overall GDP, I think you could argue that the Middle East is now even more important <coughs> to the financing of the U.S. current account deficit than China. And one thing you can say with pretty close to absolute certainty, the GCC will collectively emerge over the next decade as the world's most important investor. Now, what are the strategic consequences <coughs> of that? First, I think it means that the winners in this process have growing strategic leverage. Steve talked about how the world without the West is taking shape essentially by routing around American power. And I think that there is a lot of truth to that. They don't want to confront the United States. That is a losing proposition. The United States is in this, I think, historically unprecedented position of being a global hegemon which will continue to have unprecedented military primacy for at least the next quarter century and probably longer than that, but is losing standing influence power in virtually every other arena. So why would these countries want to confront us in the one arena in which we still remain and will remain unquestionably dominant? I think they are routing around the West. But I think they're also doing something else, something that um, a political scientist at Chicago, Robert Pace, described as soft balancing. They are looking for non-military ways to influence and, if necessary, constrain us. And this chart is giving them real options for doing that down the line. Um, third, I, I, secondly, I would say, and it plays into the world without the, the West hypothesis, you increasingly see the winners in this process beginning to cooperate, deepen their interconnectivity, not just in economic spheres, but in strategic spheres. Look at Russia, China, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization which has already succeeded effectively in rolling back U.S. military deployment in Central Asia, and I think is essentially creating a strategic environment in Central Asia where the United States will be, if it doesn't change course very, very soon, will be essentially permanently in a sort of second, second place position in terms of competing for strategic influence in the Caspian Basin. Um, third, I would say, and I think I agree with Steve here, that the U.S. position in this regard is not unrecoverable. But recovery is going to take real change. And it's going to take real change economically, obviously, but I think it's going to take real change strategically. <clears throat> the United States is no longer going to be able to afford the illusion that it is the indispensable nation. We will not be able to afford the illusion <clears throat> that we can do what we want. We never have to prioritize. We never have to make trade-offs in our dealings with Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, that we can simply have this maximalist and undifferentiated agenda of things that we want and other countries will essentially have to fall in line behind that. That is an increasingly dangerous delusion for the United States. Unfortunately, we have a foreign policy debate right now, particularly in the context of this presidential campaign which is for all intents and purposes about some other planet than the one that's described on this chart. You know? And I'm, I'm basically an equal opportunity critic on that point. I think that Senators McCain, Obama, and Clinton are all 
avoiding 99% of the substance on this chart. And they're doing it willfully. Um, so I don't think the U.S. position is inherently unrecoverable. But I have to say I become increasingly pessimistic about the capacity of the American political order to deal seriously and realistically with these trends. Thank you.